And now please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, one advantage of being a minister is that you have the great privilege of going to an awful lot of weddings. And in the course of those weddings, there are always these stories that throw you off a bit, these things that happen where you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that one. Just this past September, I had a wedding for a church member here, a child of the church, and it was down on Cape Cod on Saturday right in Chatham. The wedding was set up on the beach. You could see the chairs there. Everything was all ready to go, and then Hurricane Lee came right through. And as fate would have it, the last name of the bride is, of course, Lee. I remember another instance where we're down in Houston, and there is a wedding, and this, the, the bride, also a daughter of the church, was getting married a little later in life, um, and she had a tendency to be a slightly absent-minded, and we're there gathering before the service, and maybe it's 20 minutes before the service is supposed to start, and she's like, I forgot my wedding dress. And so she got in the car and drove 25 minutes to her house and back to grab her wedding dress. The nice thing was, everyone in the sanctuary knew and loved this person, and so everyone sat very politely for, for her to arrive, and the wedding just started a bit late. But no matter what happened in the various weddings I've been to, I haven't had any situation quite like the one we find in our text for this morning in the Gospel of Matthew. Here you've got the Palestinian tradition of weddings, where, back in those days anyway, where the groom goes to the bride's house and negotiates the terms of the marriage in a ritualistic way to start the wedding ceremony. And once those negotiations are done, the groom then comes and meets his bride. People meet him on the way. There's this wonderful procession to the groom's house where there is the great wedding feast. Now, of course, on this time, in this particular story, we have a situation where the bridesmaids are sitting there waiting, and there's no groom. And more time goes by, and there's no groom. In fact, so much time goes by that the bridesmaids all fall asleep. And then finally, there's the great shout at midnight, and the groom is coming, and they wake up, and the wise bridesmaids have brought with them flasks of oil. The foolish bridesmaids have not. The foolish bridesmaids are saying then to the wise bridesmaids, please give us some of your oil so we can partake in the procession. And they're like, there's not enough to go around. Go buy your own. So they do, but by the time they get back, the groom had come, the wedding feast had started, and the door was shut. And when these five, described as foolish virgins, go to the door and knock and say to the bridegroom, Lord, Lord, let us in, the response is, I don't even know you. Now, there might be a something here with my mic, so I'm going to test this out and see if this fixes the problem. Hello? Ah, there we go. Slight microphone issues. So we have this situation here where you have these five foolish bridesmaids left on the outside. And then you have the final line that Jesus says in this parable that he offers. Be vigilant, be watchful, for you never know the time or the hour. Be prepared, make sure you have your oil with you. The context of this passage is very clearly one of the parousia, or parousia. This is not something that most liberal Christians like to wrestle with. This is a, the context of this is the second coming of Jesus, that when the bridegroom arrives, when the second coming comes, will you be prepared? Will you have your oil? Are you vigilant? In fact, I, it was interesting listening to that great African-American spiritual that we sang just now. The, 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 the original words for that are, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, for the time is growing nigh. But the good liberal UCC thought that was too uncomfortable, so they changed the words till the work's almost done. That's actually not the context. This is the context of the second coming. This is the context of some sort of final judgment. And the question is, when that comes, will you... Be ready. Whether that comes at the end of your life or at some final consummation. Now this sermon is not a sermon on the second coming. That's an entirely different topic for another time. 
And in fact, here, there's actually quite a bit of vagueness about what that will look like. But there is, coming from Jesus, this sense that something's coming and you should be prepared. Whatever shape it might take. So the question that, asks, that we just have to ask ourselves is, what's this oil that we need? What does the oil represent in this text that we have in Matthew 25? And different commentators over history have put forth different guesses for what the oil is in Matthew 25. Martin Luther, unsurprisingly, said, oh, the oil is faith. That's what we need. You had Augustine of Hippo saying, oh, the oil is love. The vast majority of commentators through history, however, have said that the oil that we need in our flasks is actually good works. This fits the context of the evangelist Matthew. Those of you who are good scholars of your Bible know that this chapter 25 has three great parables, three famous parables. This is the first one of the ten virgins or the ten maidens. The second one is the parable of the talents. Make sure you don't bury your talent, but use it. And that particular passage has a, also a, a pretty dark ending for those who don't use their talents wisely. Then you have another passage that reemphasizes the same point. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. This is the famous passage of the sheep and the goats, where when the Son of Man appears, he will divide people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And that separation occurs based on those who saw Jesus thirsty and gave him something to drink, saw him hungry and gave him something to eat, saw him naked and clothed him, saw him sick and cared for him. When he was in prison, they visited him. Those who do those things go off to the good place. Those who don't do those things go off to the bad place. So it seems clear that this oil is referencing a similar thing as the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats. Moreover, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, great classic. Remember, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount not to hide our lamp under a bushel basket, but to let the light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So it's a pretty intense passage. Do you have your oil? How is your supply of oil these days? Have you thought about that recently? This is one of the things, it's just, it's so hard, though. Because we're busy. I mean, when was the last time you had the chance to volunteer? I mean, Jeff and Neely were talking about the struggles of families and how busy they were. When was the last time you had the chance to volunteer, to do good works in some way, shape, or form? Do you think if the time was now, you'd be able to say, oh, I've done enough? I mean, this is the challenge that Jesus offers to the disciples and those that are there. It's the same challenge that echoes through the ages to Christians. Where do you stand on this? And it's hard. Like, don't get me wrong. This is very hard. Our entire society in, in 20th, 21st century America is set up to have you prioritize a whole host of things. You're set, this society is set up so you work your tail off. You're working 60 or more hours a week as the norm. You're set up to devote huge amounts of resources and time to your children so they can have as many opportunities as possible. Your phones in your pockets literally have algorithms designed to soak up all your time. You watch that Netflix show that you like, and before you know, before you know it, the next episode is already playing. And then you've watched three or four episodes in a row. Our entire society is designed to get your attention, to get your eyeballs, to make you busy. And the question is, where does the oil fall into this? The question of priorities. And it's difficult to make these priorities. At a certain point, we as Christians have to make a choice to prioritize good works and service to God in some way or shape or form. We have to actively choose that. And I realize that your ability to do that does vary depending on your circumstances in life. Now, again, I'm a clergy person. One advantage of that is I get to work in my job where I get to help people for my job. This is great. But I've also wanted to push myself at various points to say, well, I still have to do more than that. I have to make sure that I'm doing stuff just beyond the church 
So when I was working at Memorial Church at Harvard, one of the things I did was I volunteered at the Harvard Square Homeless Shelter on a regular basis, and I loved doing that. I, I did prison tutoring at the Suffolk County Prison. When I served a church in Iowa, I was on the board of an organization that provided group homes for those with intellectual disabilities, and also was on the board of an organization that had homeless shelter services and other services for youth in central Iowa. When I was at Houston, I found myself being so caught up in the church work that I didn't have as much time for these things. And so I remember going to the head of our missions board and saying, when you have some sort of volunteer activity, let me know. I promise you I will be there. I owe that to God and to my call from Jesus. One of my laments of this past year here at the Hills Church, the past 10 months, is that I've been so busy with church stuff and getting to know you and resettling in Wellesley that I haven't had the time to go out and serve people outside the wall. I intend to change that. Now, the good Protestants out there, and I'm sure there are many of you, are thinking to yourself, why is John, a good Protestant, dressed up like a good Protestant, <laughs> preaching about works righteousness? I thought we were Protestants, right? I thought you're saved by faith, not by works. What's this whole stuff about works righteousness? About, oh, you've got to make sure your oil and the work, your good works, that's what you're going to be judged on. Well. I want to modify that slightly. And for this, I want to look a little bit at ways in which ethics are often framed. I know you thought you might get away without some theology in a sermon, but not today. So t typically, those of you who are familiar with ethical reasoning, how you reason about what, what's right and what's wrong, typically ethics have been divided into two schools, two frameworks. One is so-called command ethics or deontological ethics a word you usually hear on Sunday morning, deontological. <laughs> what this is, is basically, it's this whole sense that there are certain things that are right always and forever. They come from, say, God. You know, you should, you, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife or possessions. Anytime you have a thou shalt not, there are certain things that are true always and forever. That framework of ethics is a command ethics, a deontological ethics. There are certain things that are right, there are certain things that are wrong. Well, there's a, another ethical framework is a consequentialist or teleological ethics. This is you judge the ethics based on the results of what happens. So stealing might be good if you're stealing to feed your family. Lying might be good if you're lying to prevent the Nazis from capturing a Jew you're hiding in your home. So again, you have consequentialist ethics. What's right and what's wrong is decided by the end results. A command ethics, some things are always right and always wrong. There's a great example that I'm probably, you know, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with, of like the railroad design. You know, like a railroad car is going down the tracks and there are three people that are strapped to the railroads and if you don't do anything, that railroad is going to get them. So you have the capacity to pull a lever, but if you pull a lever, the train goes and kills someone else. Do you do it or do you not? Command ethics would say, thou shalt not kill, so you're not going to touch the lever. A consequentialist ethics said, yes, I'm going to kill that person, but I'll save three others. Familiar with that? I'm sure you've seen the graphic of it. Well, about 40 years ago, ethicists were like, this is nonsense. Never once has this happened. <laughs> and moreover, that's not the way we make ethical decisions in our lives. If you have an ethical decision, it's rarely are you like, huh, is this a command ethics or a consequentialist ethics situation? <laughs> what they're saying is that what, what these... Fear, what, what these ethicists were talking about is, is something that became known as virtue ethics, where what actually happens is you cultivate certain virtues and ways of being, and when you come to those situations, you merely act out of habit. So for instance, let's say you cultivate the virtue of generosity, where you practice generosity throughout your life. Unsurprisingly, when someone comes to you, you respond generously because you've worked that muscle, you've nurtured that virtue. Let's say compassion is something that you, that, you, that you nurture as a virtue. You try and be compassionate to those whom you meet whenever you meet them. That then becomes a muscle that becomes well worked and you just act compassionately out of instinct. Of course, it can also work in the negative. If you practice lying and cheating and stealing to get ahead, well, you just do it without even thinking. So in this framework, what we do is you try and Name the kind of virtues you want to develop, and then you practice them, and then they become more second nature. 
And I think this is exactly what Jesus is getting at here. Again, remember the five foolish virgins still had oil in their flasks, they just didn't have enough. It's a question of practicing those virtues, practicing those good works so they become second nature, they become a part of who you are. Of course you're going to help out because it's something that you work on, but you have to start somewhere. You have to begin practicing those virtues. Now here's the great thing. We live in a time of a lot of stressors. You've got a horrible war going on in Gaza that every time I turn on the television or turn on my phone, I'm horrified by. You have the recent shooting up in Maine. You have the disasters of climate change. You have dysfunctional politics. You have things going on in your life. There's so many things in your life that are going on that you can't control, and these oftentimes drive you crazy. And so one of the answers to this is to try and do something you can control. In our parable for today, Jesus has these ten maidens. They can't control what time the bridegroom comes. What they can control? Whether they have their flasks of oil. There's a certain amount of power that comes in exercising your agency. In the midst of all the things going on in the, in the world today, what can you control? You can actually go out and practice the virtue of doing good works and building up your flasks of oil. And here's the good thing. When you do it, you get to participate in the banquet, not just a heavenly banquet sometime in the future, but when Jesus shows up in the face of the person that you're helping. You get to celebrate that banquet. I bet if you thought about some time recently that you helped somebody, you helped somebody in which you saw Jesus in that person, that there was some degree of banquet that was celebrated at that moment. Now, this is a particularly important time of year for us here in the Hills Church to hear these words from Jesus. Because we're coming out of the pandemic when the church naturally sort of looked inward. And now, as we're continuing to grow and get, and I'm here and Will's here and we're getting new staff, I really want in the year ahead for us to be engaged in the world outside these walls. But we need your help in order to do that. Amory Holloway has done an incredible job as a minister here, leading different groups to do good works in the community. As she moves on to her next call in life, who is going to step up to help? Judy has done an incredible job nurturing the care team and so many of the connections that nurture us here in this church. As she moves on, how are we going to step up and help and make sure those good works are being done? You have a great opportunity with Sue's gifts, a great opportunity with Food for, for Family Promise next week. Opportunities abound. What are you going to do about it? There is that great quotation that's often attributed to William Penn that I love so much. I expect to pass through this life but once. So if there is any good that I can do or any kindness I can show to my fellow human being, let me do it now, for I shall not pass this way again.